From the adjoining hills, we look down on the historic city of Hyderabad, home of the Nizam, now the Raj Pramukh. The fourth largest city in India, it was founded by a romantic prince in 1589. The famous Hussein Sagar Lake is known as the Blue Danube of Hyderabad. Built in 1562, Facts and fable are invoked with equal credulity in tracing the origin of this vast and wonderful sheet of water. This is the main bridge over which the traffic of the city flows. All sorts of vehicles, from modern automobiles to van propelled rickshaws and antiquated pony carts, fly along this busy thoroughfare. The fez, worn by some of these men, was the favorite headgear of both Hindus and Muslims in Hyderabad. But with the state's integration with the Indian Union, this cap is fast going out of fashion. The city is a confluence of Hindu-Muslim culture and combines medieval magnificence with modern elegance. The story of this Deccan metropolis is really the tale of two cities, Hyderabad and Sikandrabad. Sikandrabad was merged into the parent town five years ago. Overlooking the River Musi is the Osmania Hospital, a magnificent three-story structure built in the superb indo saracenic style. It is the biggest hospital in the whole state, ministering to the needs of the sick and ailing. Adjoining the hospital are the spacious public parks, a favorite spot to which the people of the city throng during all hours of the day. These grand buildings are the law courts, where the highest tribunal in the state holds its session. Close by is the Musi River, which caused immense loss of life in the disastrous cyclonic storm of 1908. Here is a doby guard in the river where the laundry of the city is washed by an army of men and women. Thousands of clothes are washed from sunrise to sundown and then spread all over the bank to dry in the sun. A strenuous job, you'll agree, but don't be surprised if you miss a shirt or two. Like most cities in India, Hyderabad is a city of contrast. Modern buildings stand side by side with old houses. Some streets are crowded and packed with tiny shops. Vehicles of all kinds and in all conditions jog along with supreme unconcern for traffic regulations. Charminar, or the four minarets, described as the Arc de Triomphe of the East, is an imposing structure which stands right in the heart of Hyderabad. Built in 1591, it is 180 feet high. Char Minar was erected as an expression of man's gratitude to God Almighty for delivering the city from the dreadful scourge of plague. Of historical interest is the Mir Alam Tank, a lake eight miles in circumference. The dam is formed of 21 arches side by side, presenting their convex surfaces to the pressure of the water. Nearly three quarters of a mile long, it was built by French engineers to supply Hyderabad city with its drinking water. It is a fine example of engineering skill, and in spite of its age and curious construction, the strength of its masonry remains unimpaired. Let us now leave the city and its suburbs to have a look at some of the historical places in the state. This is the famous fort of Golconda, from where the valiant kings of the Qutub Shahi dynasty offered stubborn resistance to the imperialist aggression of the Mughals. For nearly two centuries, Golconda was the royal capital of these kings. And as we go through to the inner fort, we come to these old guns and cannonballs, made of solid stone, now used to line and decorate the roadway. These children who live in the fort put them to good use. The outside fort is surrounded by a moat and a strongly built crenellated stone wall, a little over three miles in circumference, 
with 87 bastions. The walls and bastions are built of solid blocks of granite. Mounted on top of the bastions are still to be found some of the old Qutub Shahi guns. The fort originally had eight of these double massive gates, but only four are now in use. After the fall of Golconda, the country was converted into a Mughal province, and later came under the sway of the present dynasty, whose founder, the great Nizam ul Mut, became virtual sovereign of Hyderabad. This one man power homemade roundabout gives a heap of fun to the children of Golconda Fort. The splendor has disappeared, but the fame of the fort as a citadel of patriotism remains imperishable. We are now at the state hotel of Aurangabad. Aurangabad is rightly described as the Shader of India. From the entrance to the hotel, you can get a glorious view of Bibi Kamakbara, a wonderful mausoleum built by Emperor Aurangzeb in memory of his favorite wife, Rabia Durrani. Whether seen from far or near, Bibi Kamakbara unfolds itself to view like a jewel. Himself a man of simple and austere habits, the great Mughal Emperor spared neither labor nor money in raising this marvelous monument. Vast quantities of pure white marble were used in the construction of this wonderful tomb. It is an imitation of the immortal Taj Mahal, built by his father, Shah Jahan, at Agra. Aurangzeb was endowed with many commanding virtues, but was not blessed with a great quality of religious toleration. Even so, he was a master builder. Rarely has a Puritan raised a more enduring and grander monument to the memory of his wife. About a mile from Makbara is the Panchakki or water mill. It has a special water channel of its own, which is used to work a small, roughly constructed water wheel. The source of the water is not known, and it is believed that the project was completed in the time of Aurangzeb. It adjoins the shrine of Shah Muzaffar Sahib, the spiritual guide and preceptor of the Emperor Aurangzeb. This young Muslim girl with her quaint headgear is fascinated by the fish in the tank, which are held sacred. The progenitors of the fish were placed there during the time of the Emperor. Near the water mill, alongside the picturesque moat, we come to the shrine of Aurangzeb's teacher, Shah Muzaffar Sahib. The tomb is an important place of pilgrimage, and both Hindus and Muslims go there to pay homage to the memory of a pious man. Instances of Hindus and Muslims worshipping at the same shrine and participating in each other's festivals are by no means common. A calmness characteristic of India's countryside pervades Paitan, a pretty village on the banks of the river Godavari. Paitan still has an important cottage industry which specializes in gold and silver thread embroidery. The workmen use no intricate machinery. All the simple tools of the industry are homemade, but the skill of the men operating them is amazing and is acquired from their ancestors who practiced this profession for centuries. The python embroideries are unique. The designs of the fabrics are marvelous indeed. They are copied from the ornate frescoes of the Ajanta Cave. You continually wonder how these simple workmen succeed in reproducing such intricate and exquisite pieces of art with nothing but primitive implements to help them. The work is laborious, for it takes eight days to weave and embroider a foot of material only 12 inches wide. But their labor is a national asset. Look at these wonderful designs of sari borders, the finest specimens of python embroidery. Leaving python, we go to the fort of Dalatabar. It is believed to have been built by a Hindu prince late in the 12th century. Alauddin Khazji, the famous Delhi Sultan, attacked and captured the fort. Dalatabad is recorded in history as among the most fabulously rich cities in the south. From this fort, Alauddin is reported to have carried away to Delhi 2,500 pounds of gold, 300 pounds of pearls, 80 pounds of jewels, including rubies, diamonds, jaspers and emeralds, 40,000 pounds of silver, and 5,000 pieces of rich silk embroidery. The fort, 
a cone-shaped hill, rises almost perpendicularly from the plain to a height of about 600 feet. And so we come to the little village of Rauza, 14 miles from Aurangabad. The village is virtually dead, and is of interest to the tourists only because of the tomb of the Emperor Aurangzeb. This is the entrance to Aurangzeb's mausoleum. A Muslim priest enters to recite verses from the Quran, the holy book. What a contrast between this simple tomb and the splendor of the Makbara, his wife. The emperor desired that his sepulcher should be simple and unpretentious as enjoined by the tenets of Islam. In the evening of his life, Aurangzeb came down to the south to destroy the nascent Maratha Empire. But by his costly and countless campaigns, he convulsed the whole of Hindustan, but failed to uproot rebellion. A broken-hearted man, the aged emperor died in 1707 and was buried here simply. Farewell to these thoughts about the rise and fall of empires. Let us now explore the Elora Cave about which we've heard so much. We're now right in front of the Buddhist cave. Excavated in the scarp of a large rocky plateau, the Elora Caves are remarkable memorials to Buddhism, Hinduism, and Jainism. Over half the caves contain large sculptures, constituting some of the finest sculptural galleries in the world. The treatment of the religious themes is masterly, all done in a manner characteristic of great art. These are the works of Titan, who have left behind imperishable monuments to their great skill. At the extreme end of the series are caves belonging to the Jain school of sculpture. They are also excellent specimens of art, rich in decorative style. The Indra Sabha is one of the best examples of this type. The Hindu caves rival all others in skill, beauty and workmanship. But most marvelous of all is the stupendous rock-cut Hindu temple of Kailash elaborately carved inside and outside. It is hewn entirely out of solid rock, with massive pillars and colonnades, intricate galleries, and huge sculptures. Kailash is one of the wonders of the world. It is believed that the task of quarrying its three million cubic feet of rock by chisel and hammer took at least 100 years, a labor of love of Himalayan proportion. Here you see the chief rivers of India deified in stone. These three goddesses represent three mighty rivers, the goddess Saraswati, the goddess Ganges, and the goddess Jamna, whose sacred and perennial waters give sustenance to millions of people in India. This is Lord Shiva, god of destruction. Unlike the other cave temples, Kailash is isolated from the surrounding rock. It stands in a court averaging 154 feet wide by 276 feet long, with a scarp 107 feet high at the back. It is colossal in size, intricate in plan, extravagant in decoration, and enriched with roofs, caves, pillars, figures, and base reliefs, all hewn vertically out of the heart of the rock. At one time, it was painted in a style befitting its elaborate sculpture. Here is a concrete example of faith moving mountains. Men with lesser imagination and determination would have quailed at the thought of hewing into shape a structure of such gigantic proportions. But the pious men of Hindustan did it because they believed they had a mission to fulfill in this world. Who can rival their achievements? Here is the gateway to the tiny village of Ajanta, which has found a place on the map of the world by its proximity to the celebrated Ajanta Cave. The caves are situated in a secluded ravine of enchanting beauty and consist of 24 monasteries and five temples, some of which are 2,000 years old. We'll now look at some of the world famous frescoes. Most of the paintings represent incidents from the Jataka stories of the Buddha. Here is a palace scene with a prince as a central figure a Raja in conversation with his favorite wife. The great
great bodhisattva. This is the famous temptation of Buddha. Mara, an evil spirit, fearful of the Lord, tries to deflect him. The black princess, whose sable beauty has won the admiration of all. A glimpse of the highly decorative motifs painted on the ceiling. The birth of Buddha, the deliverer of mankind from strife and violence. The authors of these masterpieces were Buddhist priests who painted them with a the delicate ardor of their faith. Woman is the finest achievement of their art, and obviously its most admired theme. No minor detail was insignificant to these masters. They were conscious that they had set out to preach to posterity in color and form the unity of life. No less wonderful is the sculpture in the cave. The carvings have been executed on a wall of almost perpendicular rock, 250 feet high, sweeping in a horseshoe, and extending for a third of a mile from east to west, while the caves of Elora represent the confluence of three great faiths, Hinduism, Buddhism, and Jainism. Those of Ajanta are exclusively Buddhist. So, with a feeling of wonder at man's genius, we leave this land of ancient cities, forts, and caves, and say goodbye to Hyderabad the 